Hi, today I'm going to read to you Mikhail Bakunin's Revolutionary Catechism, published in 1866 while he was in a Russian prison. Now, Mikhail, Mikhail Bakunin is probably the most important, in my opinion, father of the anarchist movement, which blossoms in the mid to late 1800s. Um, the anarchists play a, a significant role in the revolutions of 1848. Um, Bakunin himself is involved in a revolution in the Czech, in, uh, the Czech Republic in 1848, and he's involved in, well, it wasn't the Czech Republic back then, back then but in the Czech Revolution. And he's involved in a revolution in France in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. He spends much of his life in and out of Russian prisons. I think he's sentenced to death at least three times. Um, he escapes from Siberia. He eventually settles in Switzerland, um, where he dies peacefully in 1876. He's born in 1814. In his youth, he's kicked out of a Russian military school. He really wants to pursue a career as a uh, professor of philosophy. He goes to Germany to study philosophy, falls in love with German philosophers, um, Hegel in particular, and moves to Paris after becoming a revolutionary. And once he becomes really interested in revolutionary ideology, and you know, beginning with the Napoleonic era and the French Revolution, you have waves of revolution going through Europe, particularly in 1848. Because of his act, revolutionary activity, Bakunin very quickly is, has no chance of becoming a philosopher at any state-sponsored university or philosophy professor, and moves from state to state, fomenting and participating in revolutions. Um, he participates in a Czech revolution in 1848. He participates in a Polish revolution around the same time. He participates in a French insurrection in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. He uh, helps, re he helps uh, revolutions in Italy against uh, Giuseppe Manzini, I believe. So Bakunin isn't just a, a philosopher of the word or an anarchist of the word, as these guys are called, who sits and writes philosophy and doesn't take any action. Bakunin is truly a man of action. And then because of that, he spends much of his life in and out of prison He's uh, sentenced to death, I think, three times. Um, loses all of his teeth in a Russian prison to scurvy. Uh, he escapes Siberia, and eventually, later in life, settles in Switzerland, um, where he dies in 1876. Uh, he's born in 1814. Um, Bakunin, in, when he's in Paris, he meets Pierre Joseph Proudhon, one of the other major founders of, uh, of anarchy or the anarchist movement along with Kropotkin in Russia, and perhaps Necheyev in Russia. And he also uh, meets and, and becomes friends for a while with Karl Marx, and actually participates with Marx in the uh, International Working Men's Association. And it's actually, uh, that association is split because of the dispute between Marx and Bakunin. And Marx believes that a communist utopia can be achieved by using the power of the state to create a socialist, uh, a socialist state or socialist utopia. Um, and Bakunin believes that the state in all its bureaucracies must be destroyed and then an anarchic government can be built um, starting with, with small, small communities, towns, cities, and built up. Like essentially Bakunin believes that if you try to use the state to create equality among the people, that whoever is in charge will eventually just dominate all the people. Like uh, one of Bakunin's quotes is something like, you know, the most horrific possible combination is socialism and totalitarianism, which, you know, in a way, Bakunin predicts, you know, um, 75 years early what will happen in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. You know, these Bolsheviks consolidate the power of the state, try to use it to create a socialist utopia, and end up just creating a totalitarian nightmare for, for much of the Russian people. So, in this section, um, the Revolutionary Catechism, Bakunin lays out, step by step, exactly the process he believes to create an anarchist worldwide federation built by new governments starting at the local level, towns and cities, um, created by universal suffrage after the destruction of all existing states. 
and then these local communities will join again based on based on freedom universal suffrage um, as they please they'll join to form bigger and bigger federations which Bakunin believes eventually will encompass the world so in this revolutionary catechism um, Bakunin lays out this plane in great detail which is what I'm going to read you now the first element of the new anarchist government and now Bakunin starts he says replacing the cult of God by respect and love of humanity. We proclaim human reason as the only criterion of truth, human conscious as conscience as the basis of justice, individual and collective freedom as the only source of order in society. And so right off the bat here, you see Bakunin's atheism. And atheism, as we've talked about before, is something many of these anarchists share. And the last selection I read you from Bakunin, God of the State, um, spells out exactly why he's an anarchist and, in quite blunt terms, um, attacks uh, the institution of particularly the Christian church. So the first thing you got to do is get rid of, of the belief in God and replace the belief in God with a respect for fellow members of humanity and justice that is based on freedom for everybody ultimate freedom. That's the number one prerequisite for the anarchist society is the most amount of freedom that anybody can enjoy and still have some sense of social organization. Okay, he goes on. Freedom is the absolute right of every adult man and woman to seek no other sanction for their acts than their own conscience and their own reason. Being responsible first to themselves and then to the society which they have voluntarily Okay, so one, it's not just men that have freedom, it's women too. And the anarchists are, as far as I can tell, the first people who actually specifically promote the democratic participation of women. They truly believe that everybody's free, not just 49%. And so he says that people, the only consequences um, for their actions should come from their own conscience and their own sense of reason and that people are responsible to themselves first, right? Taking responsibility for their own actions. And you can see some existentialism here, um, or the beginnings of existentialist thought. And then he says the society that they voluntarily accepted. So one of the major prerequisites of the anarchist society is that individuals can voluntarily join a commune and they can voluntarily leave a commune. And they can never be forced to join any social organization. So that's much different from now, whereas essentially you're a citizen of a country as soon as you're born there. You don't really have a, have a choice. I mean, you can choose to leave and go somewhere else, but you have to choose to leave. Um, it's assumed that you've chosen to be a citizen if you're born there, and they're expected to follow those laws. He goes on. It is not true that freedom of one man is limited by that of, another, of other men. Man is really free to the extent that his freedom fully acknowledged and mirrored by the free consent of his fellow men, finds confirmation and expansion in their liberty. Man is truly free only among equally free men. The slavery of even one human being violates humanity and negates the freedom of all. So if one person is a slave, the potential for all people to be slaves exists. And we can only truly understand what it means to be free if we can see that freedom reflected in everybody around us, practice it together, learning from each other. The freedom of each is therefore re realizable only in the equality of all. The realization of freedom through equality in principle and in fact is justice. So justice is the result of individual freedom and the equality of all, right? And if everybody's free, then everybody is equal, and then you can have justice. If there's one fundamental principle, he goes on, of human morality, it is freedom. To respect the freedom of your fellow man is duty. To love, help, and serve them is virtue. And so you start to see right away that Bakunin has a, a nuanced and sophisticated sense of morality. So again, anarchy is not a free-for-all of everybody for themselves. Anarchy requires an education for everyone so that they can understand that they need to respect the freedom of others and to love, help, and serve others. Just Bakunin says this shouldn't be taught by the church 
out of fear of God or by the state out of fear of police action. It should be taught by the fellow people in your town or city for the good of all. Absolute rejection of every authority, including that which sacrifices freedom for the convenience of the state. Primitive society had no conception of freedom. And as society evolved before the full awakening of human rationality and freedom, it passed through a stage controlled by human and divine authority. The political and economic structure of society must now be reorganized on the basis of freedom. Henceforth, order in society must result from the greatest possible realization of individual liberty as well as liberty on all levels of social organization. Okay, so there can be no authority for the sake of the common good, okay? There's only authority for the sake of individual freedom. So if your country is passing laws that restrict your freedom, for the sake of public safety, then according to Bakunin, that is wrong, right? You cannot restrict freedom and still allow people to be free and equal. The political and economic organization of social life must not, as at present, be directed from the summit to the base, the center to the circumference, imposing unity through forced centralization. On the contrary, it must be reorganized to issue from the base to the summit, from the circumference to, or sorry, from the circumference to the center, according to the principles of free association and federation. And then just to back up here for a second, um, he says that primitive society doesn't understand freedom. So the caveman doesn't necessarily understand freedom. And then he says, before, say, the Enlightenment, when people truly understand that people are free and that folks are rational, before that, people were ruled by kings and by churches. And he says that now that people understand that people are born free and born rational so they can accept the consequences of their freedom, society needs to be reorganized in totality. And that's why he's advocating for and fighting for these anarchist revolutions, for the reorganization of global society for the freedom of all. And so he says in this next one that society needs to be reorganized from the bottom to the top, from the circumference to the center. And so most governments today and most governments at this time, you have a, a federal or central government in the middle that makes laws that everybody else must follow. And Bakunin's idea is that you destroy all that, and then you're going to reorganize society starting with the most localized form of government. And the local governments will pass the laws that the people in the localities will need to follow. And the only laws that everybody needs to follow, with a couple exceptions that we'll get to, are ones that all of the localities can agree to. And if one locality doesn't want to follow the laws anymore of their agreement with the other localities, then they are free to leave with no consequences. Okay. Political organization. It is impossible to determine a concrete, universal, and obligatory norm for the internal development and political organization of every nation. The life of each nation is subordinated to a plethora of different historical, geographical, and economic conditions making it impossible to establish a model of organization equally valid for all. Any such attempt would be absolutely impractical. It would smother the richness and spontaneity of life, which flourishes only in infinite diversity and, what is more, contradict the most fundamental principles of freedom. However, without certain absolutely essential conditions, the practical realization of freedom will be forever impossible. And so what he's saying right there is, on the one hand, you cannot specify one way to organize every society in the world. That's totally against all these principles of anarchy. But he says there are a couple of things that all of these organizations, all of these localities must do if the ultimate goal is truly the freedom for all. So you can't make everybody do everything except, you know, And so, the conditions are that all these localities need to follow to be part of the new anarchist organization of the world. 
are the abolition of all state religions in all privileged churches, including those partially maintained or supported by state subsidies, absolute liberty of every religion to build temples to their gods and to pay and support their priests. And so and this is important, right? Bakunin is not saying that you can't have religion. He's saying everybody's free to build a temple or a church and practice whatever religion they want. What he's saying is state money, tax money, citizens' money cannot go to support a church that they don't want to be part of. So no state-supported churches. No tax breaks for the churches, okay? So get rid of state-sponsored and state-subsidized churches. And then he goes on. The churches considered as religious corporations must never enjoy the same political rights accorded to the productive associations nor can they be entrusted with the education of children, for they exist merely to negate morality and liberty and to profit from the lucrative practice of the witchcraft. And so he's saying that within your commune or within, every, within any uh, political organization that it's agreed upon by these localities, uh, workplace organizations like trade unions should be able to practice full political and trading rights with other trade unions and the people within them can vote as trade unions and perhaps make decisions that could affect um, their local government. He says churches do not have these same political rights, right? Churches do not have the ability to affect local politics or state politics in the same way that um, productive organizations, which, you know, factories, that sort of stuff. Uh, and he says that churches cannot educate children. He's going to talk about schools, but churches cannot run school. And he says all churches do is negate morality because they teach people not to do what's right out of a sense of freedom and service to their fellow man. They teach people to do what's right to escape the wrath of God. Right? He says, which is actually amoral, and it's essentially like belief in Santa Claus, so um, you don't want those folks educating your children. The next one, abolition of monarchy, establishment of a commonwealth. So the first thing you've got to do, or one of the first things you've got to do, if you want to be an anarchist state, is you can't be ruled by a king. You have to be ruled by an agreed-upon um, uh, common contract of all the locations. He goes on. Abolition of classes, ranks, and privileges. Absolute equality of political rights for all men and women. Universal suffrage. Right? And so he's talking about get rid of all noble classes, get rid of any privileges that people are born with. And this is what a lot of the revolutionary activity in the 1800s and the 1700s of the American and French Revolution were about. So get rid of nobility, um, get rid of privileges given at birth, and everybody, including women, get the vote, right? The next one, abolition, disillusion, immoral, political, and economic dismantling of the all-pervasive, regimented, centralized state, the alter ego of the church, and as such, the permanent cause of impoverishment, brutalization, and enslavement of the multitude. That is very verbose. And so essentially what he's saying is you must totally destroy the government in everything associated with the government. He's going to go on and give a bunch of explanations, but this is in order to rebuild from the bottom up local governments, then all of the officials. And he's not you know, necessarily saying kill all these people. He's just saying that they no longer have jobs, right? Um, all of the official, uh, all of the official positions in government must disappear, must disappear, and all the privileges that come with that. And he moves on. This naturally entails the abolition of all state universities. Public education must be administered only by the communes and free associations. Ab abolition of the state judiciary. All judges must be elected by the people. Abolition of all criminal, civil, and legal codes now administered in Europe, because the code of liberty can, cre can be created only by liberty itself. So you have to destroy all public education, and again, you just have to fire all these people. They no longer are, are entrusted with the education of children or adults in the case of universities. 
right? And then education is going to be retaken up at the local level decided by each individual town, city, or state. And then get rid of all the judges, right? And then re-elect all, all new judges based on local government and the will of the people through universal suffrage for men and women. And then get rid of all law and then rewrite new law based on universal suffrage of people in local communities, towns, cities, and states. And this is what he means by you can only um, create liberty through liberty. So if you want a law code that's going to, going to guarantee people freedom, then it has to be created by people who are free and equal in their ability to vote and participate in the government. Abolitions of, abolition of banks and all other institutions of state credit. So, this, so central banking as we know it today would disappear or as they knew it back in the day would disappear. And this credit would again be restored if people wanted it to be on the local level. Abolition of centralized, of all centralized administration of the bureaucracy of all permanent armies and state police. So no army no state police force, and if you want to rebuild these things, it's done based on universal suffrage at the local level. Immediate and direct election of all judicial and civil functionaries, as well as representatives, national, provincial, and communal delegates by the universal suffrage of both sexes. Right. So once you fire all of the people who had all of the jobs in the government, and you destroy all of those jobs, then, starting at the local level, you decide what you want these law codes to be and then re-elect the representatives for your town as you see fit. The internal reorganization of each country on the basis of the absolute freedom of individuals, of the productive associations, so these are like your unions, and of the communes, you know, your towns and cities. Necessity of reorganizing the right of succession, or sorry, necessity of recognizing the right of succession. Every individual, every association, every commune, every region, every nation has the absolute right to self-determination. To associate with or not to associate, to ally themselves with whomever they wish and repudiate their alliances without regard to so-called historic rights or rights consecrated by legal precedent, or the convenience of their neighbors. So if you want to join an alliance with a town next door, you can. If you want to break that alliance, you can. It all has to be based on universal suffrage within these towns. Once the right to secede, to, to, excuse me, to secede is established, secession will no longer be necessary. With the dissolution of a unity imposed by violence, the units of society will be drawn to unite by their powerful mutual attraction and by inherent necessities. So essentially he's saying, if you don't force towns, cities, and states to unite, then they will unite as they see fit for their own benefit and then would be much less likely to try to secede from unions. Consecrated by liberty, these new federations of communes, provinces, regions, and nations will then be truly strong, productive, and indissoluble. Next section, individual rights. The right of every man and woman from birth to adulthood to complete upkeep, clothes, food, shelter, care, guidance, education, public schools, primary, secondary, higher education, artistic, industrial, and scientific, all at the expense of society. Whoa, that sounds a lot like communism, right? Like the anarchists, once again, they're not about a free-for-all of everybody for themselves, right? One of the most important principles that Bakunin lays down here is everybody has a right to a free education, a public education, paid for by their locality, right? And an education in anything that folks want to learn, right? Um, but you want to learn your trade, you can pick that education, but he has in his mind, it seems a fairly standardized education that each person in your commune should receive so they can, they can truly understand how to accept the consequences of their freedom. 
the equal right of adolescents while freely choosing their careers to be helped and to the greatest possible extent supported by society. After this, society will exercise no authority or supervision over them except to respect and, if necessary, defend their freedom and their rights. So, everybody gets to choose their own careers, and your commune can help you, or should help you, try to get the best job they can within those careers. And he says that it is the responsibility of the commune, this is your town, your city, or whatever, to defend the individual rights of freedom um, to these folks. The freedom of adults of both sexes must be absolute and complete. Freedom to come and go, to voice all opinions, to be lazy or active, moral or immoral, in short, to dispose of one's persons or possessions as one pleases. Being accountable to no one, freedom to live, be it honestly, by one's own labor, even at the expense of individuals who voluntarily tolerate one's exploitation. Okay? So, total freedom of speech, total freedom of action, right? And he says freedom to live honestly by one's own labor. And this is interesting because one of the things that Bakun is going to make pretty clear here later on is everybody's got the right to start for that, right? Bakunin does not believe in subsidizing lazy people, right? Give them a free education. And he does say, you know, protect the elderly who can't work and subsidize them. And if you have folks with some mental disorders and they can't work and your town chooses, you should take care of them. But as far as your average uh, um, state collector of subsidies out of laziness, they need to starve, according to Bakunin. Although he does say that if a person wants to voluntarily support some lazy person, you know, in their house, then that is also their right. He goes on. Unlimited freedom of propaganda, speech, press, public or private assembly, with no other restraint than the natural salutary, salutary power of public opinion. Absolute freedom to organize associations, even for allegedly, allegedly immoral purposes, including even those associations which advocate the undermining or destruction of individual and public freedom. So he says, essentially, look, if you really want people to be free, they should even be free to say people shouldn't be free, right? So absolute freedom of speech, absolute freedom of the press, etc., etc. Freedom can and must be defended only by freedom. To advocate the restriction of freedom on the pretext that it is being defended is a dangerous delusion. As morality has no other source and no other object, no other stimulant than freedom, all restrictions of liberty in order to protect morality have always been to the detriment of the latter. So if you take away people's freedom, you will make them immoral, is what he's saying. Psychology, statistics, and all history prove that individual and social immorality are the inevitable consequence of a false private and public education of the degeneration of public morality and the corruption of public opinion and above all the vicious organization organization of society so he's saying the more you limit freedom the less moral people are going to be because people can only understand morality if they are free to choose their own actions and understand how to accept the consequences an eminent Belgian statistician, and it looks like it's Quetelet, points out that society opens the way for crimes later committed by malefactors. It follows that all attempts to combat social immorality by rigorous legislation which violates individual freedom must fail. Right? Quite simply, crime is created by law. Right? As soon as you make something criminal, um, then you create the crime for the people that are going to commit the crime. Um, experience, on the contrary, demonstrates that a repressive and authoritarian system, far from preventing, only increases crime. The more authoritarian you are, the more angry people are, the less they respect their own sense of morality because they've been told what is right. It comes from above, and so the less likely they're going to be moral. That public and private morality falls or rises to the extent that individual liberty is restricted or enlarged. It 
follows that in order to regenerate society, we must first completely uproot this political and social system founded on inequality, privilege, and contempt for humanity. After having reconstructed society on the basis of the most complete liberty, equality, and justice, not to mention work, for all an enlightened education inspired by respect for man, public opinion will then reflect the new humanity and become a natural guardian of the most absolute liberty. So once you give everybody freedom and everybody a true education about the freedom of man and teach them to respect the freedom of others and that they should love and serve others out of duty, that public opinion will naturally drive people to be moral. Society cannot, however, leave itself completely defenseless against vicious and parasitic individuals. Work must be the basis for all political rights. The units of society, each within its own jurisdiction, can, can deprive all such antisocial adults of political rights, except the old, the sick, and those dependent on private or public subsidy, and will be obliged to restore their political rights as soon as they begin to live by their own labor. So he says, if you don't work, you can't vote, right? Imagine if we had that today. The liberty of every human being is inalienable, and society will never require any individual to surrender his liberty or to sign contracts with other individuals except on the basis of the most complete and equality, complete equality and reciprocity. So nobody can be forced into a contract. Society cannot forcibly prevent any man or woman so devoid of personal dignity as to place him or herself in voluntary servitude to another individual. But it can justly treat such persons as parasites not entitled to the enjoyment of political liberty, though only for the duration of their servitude. So if a person decides to sign a contract making them an indentured servant or a slave to someone else, that's their right, right? They're not smart, but that's their right. We can't take away that right, but what society should do, Bakunin says, is take away their right to vote until they stop being a slave or a servant. Persons losing their political rights will also lose custody of their children. Persons who violate voluntary agreements, steal, inflict bodily harm, or above all, violate the freedom of any individual, native or foreigner, will be penalized according to the laws of society. So, if you can't vote, like if you won't work and then you can't vote, or if you decide to be a indentured servant and you can't vote, the state will take your kids. Your local community will take your kids because you are not fit to raise them. And then he says that each individual locality, commune, you know, town, state, or city, etc., um, should make laws to prevent people or to provide consequences for folks who steal, violate contracts, um, harm people physically, and try to take away freedom of other people. Individuals condemned by the laws of any and every association, commune, province, region, and nation, reserve the right to escape punishment by declaring that they wish to resign from that association. But in this case, the association will have the equal right to expel them and declare him outside its guarantee and protection. And th this is really interesting here because it says, if you break a law and you don't want to face the consequences, you're free to leave. You can just go next door to the town and not suffer the punishment. But if you decide to come back, the state doesn't have to protect you from other people killing you, right? Really interesting. And you can kind of see in this law, or you can see this law reflected in modern society and how some countries won't let other countries extradite criminals. You know, so if Edward Snowden commits a crime in America, he can go to Russia, and if Russia doesn't want to extradite him, then in a sense, Edward has decided not to face the consequences to the crime he's committed by voluntarily leaving his country of origin and going somewhere else. Rights of association. Federalism. The Cooperative Workers Associations are a new fact in history. These are unions he's talking about. 
At this time, we can only speculate about, but not determine, the immense development that they will doubtlessly exhibit in the new political and social conditions of the future. It is possible and even very likely that they will someday transcend the limits of towns, province, and even states. Maybe he's foreseeing the multinational corporation here. They may entirely reconstitute society, dividing it not into nations, but into different industrial groups organized not according to the needs of politics, but to those of production. But this is for the future. Be that as it may, we can already proclaim this fundamental principle. Irrespective of their functions or aims, all associations, like all individuals, must enjoy absolute freedom. So any trade association or union, excuse me, or business or corporation that is organized on the universal suffrage of its workers has absolute political freedom to make or break contracts with any other association, town, or commune. Neither society nor any part of society, commune, province, or nation, has the right to prevent free individuals from associating freely for any purpose whatsoever, political, religious, scientific, artistic, or even for the exploitation or corruption of the naive or alcoholics, provided that they are not minors. So you can even have an organization that seeks to you know, sell people goods that, uh, that you're lying about to make a profit, as long as you're not doing it to kids. You can create an organization that's going to ex exploit the drunkenness of alcoholics, you know, like setting up a casino and serving booze so you can get their money, as long as they're not minors. To combat charlatans and, permission and pernicious associations is the special affair of public opinion, not the state of the opinions of the people. But society is obliged to refuse to guarantee civic rights of any association or collective body whose aims or rules violate the principles of human justice. So if you are creating an organization that seeks to exploit the drunkenness of some people, it's totally your freedom to do so, but you don't have the same rights to make contracts with other associations, towns, or communes that other folks have. Individuals shall not be penalized or deprived of their full political and social rights solely for belonging to such unrecognized societies. The difference between the recognized and unrecognized associations will be the following. The juridically recognized associations will have the right to the protection of the community against individuals or recognized groups who refuse to fulfill their voluntary obligations. The juridically unrecognized associations will not be entitled to such protection by the community, and none of their agreements will be regarded as binding. So, if you're a charlatan, a faker, and you're selling a fake product and you're exploiting people, that's that's your freedom. But your contracts are always about to be void. They're always allowed to be void. People do not have to pay you for your services. Um, under the same laws that they would have to pay somebody who is considered a legitimate organization. Next, the division of a country into regions, provinces, districts, and communes, as in France, will naturally depend on the traditions, the specific circumstances, and the particular nature of each country. We can only point out here two fundamental and indispensable principles which must be put into effect by any country seriously trying to organize itself as a free society. First, all organizations must proceed by way of a federation from the base to the summit, from the commune to the coordinating association of the country or nation. So, nations are welcome to organize themselves, right? But the organization has to start on the local level, and each locality is able to voluntarily join a larger governmental group. Second, there must be at least one autonomous intermediate body between the commune and the country, the department, the region, or the province. Without such an autonomous intermediate body, the commune, in the strict sense of the terms, would be too isolated and too weak to be able to resist 
the despotic centralist pressure of the state, which would inevitably, as is, as happened twice in France in the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848, restore to power a despotic monarchical regime. Despotism has its source much more in the centralized organization of the state than in the despotic nature of kings. And so all he's saying is, Communes can voluntarily agree to join together to form a larger governmental group for the benefit of all. But in between the commune and the next level of government has to be this intermediate other group of people who can act on the basis or act in defense of the commune against this new larger government. Because Bakunin believes that naturally the larger governments become the spot. The basic unit of all political organization in each country must be the completely autonomous commune constituted by the majority vote of all adults of both sexes. So these are towns, cities, and states. However, those individuals want to organize by size. But that is the number one political organization, and they have the ultimate rights over their citizens, or the citizens have the ultimate rights within those communes. No one shall have either the power or right to interfere in the internal life of the commune. So, for example, the federal government never has the right to interfere in the laws of the state. The state never has the right to interfere with the laws of the town. The commune elects all functionaries, lawmakers, and judges. It administers the communal property and finances. Every commune should have the incontestable right to create without superior sanction its own constitution and legislation. But in order to join and become an integral part of the provincial federation, the commune must conform its own particular charter to the fundamental principles of the provincial constitution and be accepted by the parliament of the province. So, on the one hand, the commune has the absolute right to make any laws it so chooses, as long as it's by universal suffrage of both sexes. But if other states have an organization that they've agreed upon and this commune wants to join together with them, well, then they have to follow the rules of that federation, right? The commune must also accept the judgments of the provincial tribunal in any measures ordered by the government of the province. All measures of the provincial government must be ratified by the provincial parliament. Communes refusing to accept provincial laws will not be entitled to its benefits. So if you want to be part of a federated province working together with other towns and cities um, for, for the collective good, you have to follow the will of the representatives for all those towns and communes. But if you don't want to, you just don't get the same trade or associated benefits of those other towns. And you are free to leave at any time and join some other group. The province must be nothing but a free federation of autonomous communes. The provincial parliament could be composed of either a single chamber with representatives of each of the communes or of two chambers the other representing the population of the province, independent of the communes. The provincial parliament, without interfering in any manner whatsoever in the internal discussions of the communes, will formulate the provincial constitution based on the principles of this catechism. This constitution must be accepted by all communes wishing to participate in the provincial parliament. The provincial parliament will enact legislation dividing the rights and obligations of individuals communes and associations in, re in relation to the provincial federation and the penalties for violations of its laws. It will reserve, however, the right of the communes to diverge on secondary points, though not on the fundamentals. And so what you see here is, once again, anarchy is anything but a free-for-all of individuals with no laws. Bakunin not only has a nuanced view of local government, which he sees as the highest form of government and the, the ultimate authority in decisions, but he also has a nuanced view of state and even national governments. He just believes that these all must be organized specifically from the town or city level.
The provincial parliament, in strict accordance with the charter of the Federation of Communes, will define the rights and obligations existing between the communes, the parliament, the judicial tribunal, and the provincial administration. It will enact all laws affecting the whole province, pass on resolutions or measures of the national parliament without, however, violating the autonomy of the communes and provinces. Without interfering in the internal administration of the communes, it will allow each commune its share of the, commu of the provincial or national income, which will be used by the communes as its members decide. So you have communes freely by vote in the election of representatives um, contributing resources and the amount of which is agreed by all to a provincial government like a state government and then they all decide by representatives and vote how those are then distributed back um, to the communes. So again, he even has a, a state and national idea of, of a tax structure. Just once again, the most important level is the local. The provincial parliament will ratify or reject all policies and measures of the provincial administration, which will, of course, be elected by universal suffrage. The provincial tribunal, also elected by universal suffrage, will adjudicate without appeal all disputes between communes and individuals, communes and communes, and communes in the provincial administration or parliament. These arrangements will thus lead not to dull, lifeless uniformity, but to a real living unity to the enrichment of communal life. A unity will be created which reflects the needs and aspirations of the communes. In short, we will have individual and collective freedom. This unity cannot be achieved by the compulsion or violence of provincial power, for even truth and justice, when coercively imposed, must lead to falsehood and inequity. So these, all of these laws have to start with universal suffering not by the imposition of uh, the force from above um, to try to violence. The nation must be nothing but a federation of autonomous provinces. The organizational relations between the provinces and the nation will, in general, be the same as those between the communes and the province. Principles of the International Federation. The Union of Nations comprising the International Federation, and now we're talking about a global anarchist organization, will be based on the principles outlined above. It is probable and strongly desired as well that when the hour of the people's revolution strikes again, every nation will unite in brotherly solidarity and forge an unbreakable alliance against the coalition of reactionary nations. So essentially he's saying, when the next revolution breaks out and we're trying to form this international anarchist structure for the globe, we can hope, and he's going to say we should try to organize a defense because there's definitely going to be a violent reaction from states um, and folks who stand to lose power based on this revolution. This alliance will be the germ of the future universal federation of peoples which will eventually embrace the entire world. The International Federation of Revolutionary Peoples with a parliament, a tribunal, and an international executive committee will naturally be based on the principles of the revolution. Applied to international policy, these principles are. Every land, every nation, every people, large or small, weak or strong, every religion, province and commune has the absolute right to self-determination, to make alliances, unite or secede as it pleases, regardless of so-called historic rights and the political, commercial, or strategic ambitions of states. The unity of the elements of society in order to be genuine, fruitful, and durable must be absolutely free. It can emerge only from the internal needs and mutual attractions of the respective units of society. Abolition of alleged historic right and the horrible right of conquest. So, no nation has the right to conquer any other nation. Absolute rejection of the politics of aggrandizement of the power and glory of the state. From, for this is a form of politics which locks each country into a self-made fortress, shutting out the rest of humanity organizing itself into a closed world independent of all human solidarity, 
finding its glory, glory and prosperity in the evil it can do to other countries. A country bent on conquest is a country eternally enslaved. And so essentially he's saying that if nations want to join or provinces want to join this international anarchist federation, they must reject, excuse me, nationalism. He says nationalism causes war, causes conquest, causes suffering, and if you want to be part of the new anarchist order, you cannot be nationalism. The glory and grandeur of a nation lie only in, its de in the development of its humanity, its strength and inner vitality are measured by the degree of its liberty. The well-being and freedom of nations, as well as individuals, are inextricably interwoven. Therefore, there must be free commerce, exchange, and communication among all federated countries, and the abolition of frontiers, passports, and custom duties. So free trade around the world and freedom of travel around the world or through your nation, if you want to join the Anarchist Federation of Nations. Every citizen of a federated country must enjoy the same civic rights, and it must be easy for him to acquire citizenship and enjoy political rights in all other countries adhering to the same federation. If liberty is the starting point, it will necessarily lead to unity. But to go from unity to liberty is difficult, if not impossible. Even if it were possible, it could be done only by destroying a spurious unity imposed by force. So you can't tell people they're united in a country and then, and then expect them to act like free people. You have to first let people free and allow them the choice to join a free country. No federated country shall maintain a permanent standing army or any institution separating the soldier from the citizen. Not only do permanent armies and professional soldiers breed internal disruption, brutalization, and financial ruin, they also menace the independence and well-being of other nations. All able-bodied citizens should, if necessary, take up arms to defend their homes and their freedom. Each country's military defense and equipment should be organized locally by the commune or provincially, somewhat like the militias in Switzerland or the United States, circa 1860 um, to 1867. And so you see here that Bakunin is looking at the right to keep and bear arms and the establishment of militias in America as a great step towards ensuring the freedom of the people. And he says that standing armies essentially, eventually, will lead to warfare with other nations or the oppression of the people at home. The international tribunal shall have no other function than to settle without appeal all disputes between nations and their respective provinces. Differences between two federated countries shall be adjudicated without appeal only by the international parliament, which in the name of the entire revolutionary federation will also formulate common policy and make war, if unavoidable, against the reactionary coalition. So an international court system exists only to settle disputes between nations, right? And there can be no appeals. And the international court system is there to organize an international defense of the anarchist revolution against the reactionary countries. No federated nations shall make war against another federated country. War is illegal between countries in the anarchist international federation. If there is war and the international tribunal has pronounced its, its decision, the aggressor must submit. If this doesn't occur, the other federated nations will sever relations with it and, in case of an attack by the aggressor, will unite to repel invasion. So if one country does make war on another country and both are part of this anarchist federation, the international court has the right to stop it. And if they say stop, and one country will not stop, then the first thing that happens is they're expelled from the anarchist union. The second thing that happens is all the other anarchist countries unite and crush that other country if that other country continues to attack members of the anarchist federation. All members of the revolutionary federation must actively take part in approved wars against a non-federated state. 
if a federation, federated nation declares unjust war on an outside state against the advice of the international tribunal, it will be notified in advance that it will have to do so alone. So, if the international tribunal approves a war against a reactionary state, a non-federated state, then all the states have to commit troops or resources or fight in one way or another, right? And on the other hand, if one country wants to make war on a non-federated state and the tribunal doesn't accept it, then that country has to fight alone. But um, they're not going to be stopped by the end of this federation. It is hoped that the federated states will eventually give up the expensive luxury of separate diplomatic representatives to foreign states and arrange for representatives to speak in the name of all the federated states. And so essentially, once you have representatives um, to the Federation, to vote on issues of the Federation, you no longer need diplomats. Those representatives can take, can take care of all those diplomatic duties. Only nations or peoples accepting the principles outlined in this catechism will be admitted to the Federation. So if you want to be in the International Anarchist Federation, you've got to follow all these principles. Next, social organization. Without political equality, there can be no real political liberty. But political equality will be possible only where there, only when there is social and economic equality. So if you want people to be equal politically, right, and have an equal amount of freedom, then you first have to establish some kind of economic equality. Equality does not imply the leveling of individual differences nor that individuals should be made physically, morally, or mentally identical. Diversity in capacities and powers, those differences between races, nations, sexes, ages, and persons, far from being a social evil, constitutes, on the contrary, the abundance of humanity. Economic and social equality means the equalization of personal wealth, not by not, but not by restricting what a man may acquire by his own skill, productive energy, and thrift. And this is where the anarchists really separate from the communists. You know, like the point, he and, and Karl Marx initially are friends and have similar beliefs, right? But Marx believes that everybody should essentially have the same amount of wealth. According to Marx, the state confiscates all property and distributes it equally. According to Bakunin, you don't have to confiscate people's property, and equality means that people have the equal right to work as hard as they want to to make as much money as they want to. So the anarchist says, if you work more, you should get paid more. <clears throat> equality and justice demand only a society so organized that every single human being will from birth through adolescence and maturity, find therein equal means, first for their maintenance and education, and later for the exercise of all his natural capacities and aptitudes. This equality from birth that justice demands for everyone will be impossible as long as the right of inheritance continues to exist. So, two important points here. Bakunin says that yes, people who work harder should make more money. People with more skill and talent can make more money. He says, but everybody needs the same access to an equal education that will allow them to fully develop their own talents um, in as much as the effort they're willing to expend. He says, in order to do this, though, we have to get rid of inheritance, is what Bakun is saying. So Mark says, take all the property from people, and Bakunin says, take property from people after they die. Abolition of the right of inheritance, social inequality, inequality of classes, privileges, and wealth, not by right, but in fact, will continue to exist until such time as the right of inheritance is abolished. It is an inherent social law that de facto inequality inexorably produces inequality of rights. Social inequality leads to political inequality. And without political equality, the true universal and libertarian sense in which we understand it, 
are in that, society will always remain divided into two unequal parts. The first, which comprises the great majority of mankind, the masses of the people, will be oppressed by the privilege exploiting minority. The right of inheritance violates the principle of freedom and must be abolished. And he's essentially saying that, look, pretty much everybody ends up either making the same amount of money as their parents or inheriting the family fortune. So if you're born poor, you're probably going to wind up poor. And if you're born rich, you're probably going to wind up rich. And if you want to stop that inequality, you've got to get rid of inheritance. When equality resulting from the right of inheritance is abolished, there will still remain inequalities of wealth due to the diverse amounts of energy and skill possessed by individuals. These inequalities will never entirely disappear, but will become more and more minimalized under the influence of education and of an egalitarian social organization, and above all, when the right of inheritance no longer burdens the coming generations. So yeah, always people who work harder are going to get more. But if you get rid of inheritance, right, then that's going to be the only thing that differentiates the amount of wealth one person makes from another. Labor being the sole source of wealth, everyone is free to die of hunger, or to live in the, des in the deserts or the forests among the savage beasts. But whoever wants to live in society must earn his living by his own labor, or be treated as a parasite who is living on the labor of others. So if you want to live in the anarchist society, you go to work. Labor is the foundation of human dignity and morality. For it was only by free and intelligent labor that man, overcoming his own bestiality, in attained his humanity and sense of justice, changed his environment, and created the civilized world. The stigma which, in the ancient as well as the feudal world, was attached to labor, and which to a great extent still exists today, despite all the hypocritical phrases about the dignity of labor, the stupid prejudice against labor has two sources. First is the conviction, so characteristic of the ancient world, that in order to give one part of society the opportunity and means to humanize itself through the science, through science, the arts, philosophy, and the enjoyment of human rights, another part of society, naturally the most numerous, must be condemned to work as slaves. This fundamental institution of ancient civilization was the cause of its downfall. So the Greeks and the Romans thought that a lot of people had to be slaves in order for a few people to be educated and enlightened. And he says this eventually led to the downfall of the societies. The city, corrupted and disorganized on the one hand by the idleness of the privileged citizens and undermined on the other by the imperceptible but relentless activity of the disinherited world of slaves who, despite their energy through common labor, developed a sense of mutual aid and solidarity against oppression, collapsed under the blows of the barbarian people. The religion of the slaves much later destroyed ancient forms of slavery only to create a new slavery, right? So Christianity is essentially the religion of the poor Romans, but eventually the Christians become powerful and enslave other people. And it's through the feudal system in the Middle Ages. Privilege based on equality and the right of conquest was sanctified by divine grace, again separated society into two opposing camps, the rabble and the nobility, the serfs and the masters. So Christianity in the Middle Ages was used to justify the power of the nobility over the commons. To the, lay, to the latter was assigned no profession of arms and government, to the serfs the curse of forced labor. The same causes are bound to produce the same effects. The nobility, weakened and demoralized by depraved idleness, fell in 1789 under the blows of the revolutionary serfs and workers. The, the French Revolution proclaimed the dignity of labor and enacted the rights of labor into law but only in law for the fact of labor remained enslaved. The first source of the degradation of labor, namely the dogma of the political inequality of men, was destroyed by the Great Revolution. The, in this, I believe he's talking about the revolutions of... Oh, sorry. Um, he's talking again about the French Revolution. here. The degradation must therefore be attributed to a second source, which is nothing but the separation which still exists between manual 
and intellectual labor, which reproduces in a new form the ancient inequality that divides the world into two camps, the privileged majority, privileged not by law, but, excuse me, by capital, and the majority of workers, so the privileged minority, excuse me, the majority of workers. No longer captors of law, but of hunger. And so essentially, the right of inheritance keeps the rich rich and the poor poor, the queen is saying, even after the French Revolution gives everybody equality under the law. Right? The dignity of labor today is theoretically recognized, and public opinion considers it disgraceful to live without working. But this does not go to the heart of the question. Human labor in general is still divided into two exclusive categories. The first, solely intellectual and managerial, includes the scientists, artists, engineers, inventors, accountants, educators, and government officials, and their subordinate elite who enforce labor discipline. The second group consists of the great mass of workers, people prevented by applying creative ideas or intelligence, who blindly and mechanically carry out the orders of, into of the intellectual managerial elite. This economic and social division of labor has disastrous consequences for members of the privileged class, classes, the masses of the people, and for the prosperity as well as the moral and intellectual development of society as a whole. So he's saying in his time, despite the French Revolution, the Revolution of 1848, which gave people equality under the law, there is still a pervasive idea in society that the better kind of labor is intellectual labor, and the worse, more degrading kind of labor is manual labor. And he says this um, causes badness, causes the degradation of society. For the privileged classes, a life of luxurious idleness gradually leads to moral and intellectual degradation. So being rich and lazy makes you less moral and less smart. It is perfectly true that a certain amount of leisure is absolutely necessary for the artistic, scientific, and mental development of man. Everybody's gonna have some time to relax, have fun, and enjoy themselves if they wanna be able to express themselves and understand themselves artistically and intellectually and scientifically. Creative leisure followed by the healthy exercise of daily labor, one that is well-earned and is socially provided for all according to individuals and capacities and preferences. So, the best organization of labor is on the one hand to have some leisure time for everybody to develop their intellectual and artistic capacities, and then have everybody do some manual labor. Because then, like manual labor, gets rid of idleness, gets rid of laziness, and creates a sense of morality through a common work ethic shared among all people. Human nature is so constituted that the propensity for evil is always intensified by external circumstances, and the morality of the individual depends much more on the conditions of his existence and the environment in which he lives than his own will. And so essentially, you're more a product of your environment than you are of your own will. And so that's why it doesn't matter who you are, if you live a life of idle luxury, you're going to become less moral and more lazy. In this respect, as in all others, the law of social solidarity is essential. There can be no other moralizer for society or the individual than freedom and absolute equality. So you need to have a sense of economic and, politi and political equality to create social solidarity, which will create common value. Take the most sincere Democrat and put him on the throne. If he does not step down promptly, he will surely become a scoundrel. A born aristocrat, if he should, if he should, by some happy chance, be ashamed of his aristocratic lineage and renounce the privileges of his birth, will yearn for past glories, be useless in the present, and passionately oppose future progress. Right? So if you take somebody who believes in democracy and freedom and you make them a king, then they're going to become immoral. And at the same time, if you take somebody who's been brought up an aristocrat, and take them out of that aristocratic uh, um, privilege, then they are going to yearn for the past and, and want to go back to it. The same goes for the bourgeois, 
This dear child of capital and idleness will waste his leisure in dishonesty, corruption, and debauchery, or serve as a brutal force to enslave the working class, who will eventually unleash against him a retribution even more horrible than that of 1793. He's talking about the reign of terror and the French Revolution, the terror and the French Revolution. Um, so your bourgeois, rich capitalist, business manager, or business owner is going to be in the same problematic situation as a king because their environment will eventually become one of luxurious idleness, um, and they'll use their, their, their resources to either debauch themselves or to enslave the workers. The evils that the worker is subjected to by the division of labor are much easier to determine. Forced work for others because, or sorry, forced to work for others because he is born to poverty and misery, deprived of all rational upbringing and education, morally enslaved by religious influence. He is catapulted into life, defenseless, without initiative and without his own will. Driven to despair by misery, he sometimes revolts, but lacking that unity with his fellow workers and that enlightened thought upon which power depends, he is often betrayed and sold out by his leaders and almost never realizes who or what is responsible for his sufferings. Exhausted by feudal struggles, he falls back again into the old state of slavery. So, the defenseless, miserable, poor worker also has little hope of getting out of their surroundings and their environment and making a better life for themselves and their society under the current conditions as the Queen sees them in the 1800s. This slavery will last until capitalism is overthrown by the collective action of the workers. They will be exploited as long as education, which in a free society will be equally available to all, is the exclusive birthright of the privileged class as long as the, this minority monopolizes scientific and managerial work and the people, reduced to the status of machines or beasts of burden, are forced to perform the menial tasks assigned to them by their exploiters. And so he's saying the capitalistic system that exists at this time is, is going to continue to make the poor people poor generation after generation um, as long as education um, is unequal and as long as, uh, and and as, long as economics are unequal. This degradation of human labor is an immense evil, polluting the moral, intellectual, and political institutions of society. History shows that an uneducated multitude whose natural intelligence is suppressed and who are brutalized by the mechanical monotony of daily toil, who grope in vain for any enlightenment, constitute a mindless mob whose blind turbulence threatens the very existence of society itself. And for examples of what he's talking about, look example, look at what poor mobs do in revolutionary France, look, look what poor mobs do in pre-Caesarian Rome. Like the mobs are always angry, they're, they're generally ignorant, and they're ready to fight for food at a moment's notice with little understanding of the greater consequences of their situation. The artificial separation between manual and intellectual labor must give way to a new social synthesis. When the man of science performs manual labor and the man of work performs intellectual labor, free intelligent work will become the glory of mankind, the source of its dignity and its rights. So you gotta have both intellectual and manual labor within each individual in order for society to achieve full freedom um, and, it, and its uh, you know, intellectual, artistic, and, and productive capacities. Intelligent and free labor will necessarily be collective labor. Each person will, of course, be free to work alone or collectively. But there is no doubt that outside of work best performed individually, in industrial and even scientific or artistic enterprises, collective labor will be pre preferred by everyone. Right? People like to work together, that's what he's saying. For association, marvelous, marvelously multiplies the productive capacity of each worker. Hence, a cooperating member of a productive association will earn much more in less time. When the free productive associations, which will, organize, which will sorry, include members of cooperatives and labor organizations, voluntarily organize according to their needs and special skills, 
they will then transcend all national boundaries and form an immense worldwide economic federation. This will include an industrial parliament supplied by the associations with precise and detailed global scale statistics by harmonizing supply and demand, the parliament will distribute and allocate world industrial production to the various nations. Commercial and industrial crises, stagnation, unemployment, waste of capital, etc. will no longer plan, plague mankind. The emancipation of human labor will regenerate the world. And so he says, if everybody is able to perform both intellectual and manual labor, and everybody has a free education to maximize their potential, then people will not only want to work, but they will naturally want to work together in groups to produce more and to learn from watching the labor of others. These groups will naturally combine together to form trade organizations that will eventually become global. And when the global trade organizations begin to form a global industrial parliament should be created to help manage the resources of the globe for the good of all. And once again, all of these organizations are going to be based on the universal suffrage within all of these small collective trade organizations. The land and all natural resources are the common property of everyone but will be used only by those who cultivate it by their own labor. Without expropriation, only through the powerful pressure of the workers' associations, capital and the tools of productions will fall to those who produce wealth by their own labor. And so he's saying that you don't have to expropriate, steal the land of the rich people in this revolution. Now, this is what Marx advocates and what Lenin eventually does. What he says is that you're only allowed to make a profit if you work, right? And so if you can only make a profit from your factory by being an actual worker there and not lording over from above or a windowed office in your easy chair, then naturally managers will become workers and will work collectively with all of the other workers for the, for the benefit of all. So, don't take people's land in a revolution, just force the people who own it to work it. And if they don't work it, well then, they can't benefit from, from the fruits of their labor. Like one of my students was asking me, you know, what would this revolution mean to my, mean to my uh, dad, who owns a family business, you know, uh, uh, selling motorcycles, ATVs, and power equipment. And I said, well, the first day after the revolution, your dad would have to show up and work like everybody else, and then you would have a vote among all the workers about how to divide up the different jobs, how much of the day should be spent on mechanical work, how much of the day should be set, spent on sales, you know, how much of the day should be spent on bookkeeping, et cetera, et cetera. And then, by the mutual agreement of everybody, um, then you could establish a hierarchy at work if everybody wanted to. And then, you know, in Bakunin's ideal society, if my student's father is the best able to manage the business, as long as he's still willing to do some manual labor, then he would retain that position and continue to profit from the business. <clears throat> equal political, social, and economic rights, as well as equal obligations for women. Abolition, not of the natural family, but of the legal family founded by law and property. Religious and civil marriage to be replaced by free marriage. Adult men and women have the right to unite and separate as they please. Nor has society the right to hinder their union, excuse me, or force them to maintain it. With the abolition of the right of inheritance and the education of children assured by society, all the legal reasons for the irrevocability of marriage will disappear. The union of man and woman must be free, for a free choice is the indispensable condition for moral sincerity. In marriage, man and woman must enjoy absolute liberty 
neither violence nor passion nor rights surrendered in the past can justify an invasion by one of the liberty of another. And every such invasion so shall be considered a crime. And remember, when Bakunin is writing this, wives are generally the property of their husbands. And so he's saying, one, in marriage, both parties are totally equal. And two, we got to get rid of legal marriage altogether. Because as soon as the state forces people to stay married, then the morality of marriage will disappear. It will become an obligation and not a commitment. It says, if you want to be together, be together. If you want to separate, separate. From the moment of pregnancy to birth, a woman and her children shall be subsidized by the communal organization. Women who wish to nurse and wean their children shall also be subsidized. So, your commune is going to take care of you while you're pregnant, right? And even while you're breastfeeding, right up until the point where you wean your child. Parents shall have the right to care for and guide the education of their children under the ultimate control of the commune which retains the right and the obligation to take children away from parents who, by example, or by cruel and inhuman treatment, demoralize or otherwise hinder the physical and mental development of their children. So it seems that in this anarchist state, your, your town or your city has a heck of a lot of rights to take your children away from you if you're teaching them, for example, not to work, or if you are an abusive parent. Children neither belong to their parents nor to society. They belong to themselves and to their own future liberty. Unlike, or sorry, until old enough to take care of themselves, children must be brought up under the guidance of their elders. It is true that parents are their natural tutors, but since the very future of the commune itself depends on the intellectual and moral training it gives to children, the commune must be the tutor. The freedom of adults is possible only when the free society looks after the education of minors. So schools are there to train, to train people, to train children to understand the nature of their own freedom and the responsibility that freedom um, um, gives with it. And so and it's only through teaching children to take responsibility for their freedom and the importance of work that the commune can survive, and therefore, kids have to go to the communal school. The secular school must replace the church with the difference that while religious indoctrination perpetuates superstition and divine authority, the sole purpose of secular public education is the gradual, progressive initiation of children into liberty by the triple development of their physical strength, their minds, and their will. Reason, truth, justice, respect for fellow men, and a sense of personal dignity which is inseparable from the dignity of others, love of personal freedom and the freedom of others, the conviction that work is the base and condition for rights. These must be the fundamental principles of all public education. So here again, you hear Bakunin railing against uh, church schools and saying that churches simply indoctrinate people into superstition, um, believing in something that he is quite sure doesn't exist. And then you see him saying again that the basis of a successful anarchist society is a secular public school that teaches children to love their personal freedom and the freedom of others, to respect their fellow men, and to, to love to work and to realize that to work is to live and that they're inseparable. Above all, education must make men and inculcate human values first, and then train specialized workers. As the child grows older, authority will give way to more and more liberty, so that by adolescence he will be completely free and will forget how in childhood he had to submit unavoidably to authority. Respect for human worth, the germ of freedom, must be present even while children are being severely disciplined. The essence of all moral education is this, inculcate children with respect for humanity and you will make good men. So respect for humanity, respect for each other, this is the basis for a society based on freedom. Because if individuals respect each other as they respect themselves, then truly you can free everybody to, to follow their own will. And again you see 
that this is a cornerstone in education. And that in order to teach kids this, Bakunin suggests that they may have to be severely disciplined, right? The kids are going to be carefully controlled and indoctrinated in their childhood in order to be able to accept the consequence, consequences of a society based on freedom. Having reached the age of adulthood, the adolescence will be proclaimed autonomous and free to act as he, deemed, as he deems best. In exchange, society will expect him to fulfill only these three obligations, that he remain free, that he live by his own labor, and that he respect the freedom of others. And as the crimes and vices infecting present society are due to the evil organization of society, it is certain that in a society based on reason, justice, and freedom, on respect for humanity, and on complete equality, the good will will prevail, or the good will prevail, and the evil will be a morbid exception, which will diminish more and more under the pervasive influence of an enlightened and humanized public opinion. So if you truly educate people about their worth as human beings, about their equality, and you bring people up to be free and accept the consequences of their actions, and if you bring people up knowing that they must work to provide their own life, then most of the crimes in society will disappear. The old, sick, and infirm will enjoy all political and social rights and be bountifully supported at the expense of society. So here again, you see Bakunin's and, and the anarchist socialism, right? This idea of community-based democratic socialism where you have sick people being taken care of and old people being taken care of by their individual communities, their towns, their cities, etc. Revolutionary policy. It is our deep-seated conviction that since the freedom of all nations is indivisible, national revolutions must become international in scope. Just as the European and world reaction is unified, there should no longer be isolated revolutions, but a universal, worldwide revolution. Therefore, all the particular interests, the vanities, pretensions, jealousies, and hostilities between and among nations must now be transformed into the unified, common, and universal interest of the revolution, which alone can ensure the freedom and independence of each nation by the solidarity of all. So Bakunin is saying you can't have individual nations revolting one here and one there because they'll be crushed by the unified international reaction of the powers that be. So he's talking about a spontaneous, well, not necessarily spontaneous, probably fairly well orchestrated, but a unified revolution occurring at the same time around the world. And here again, Bakunin, when he's talking about the world, is likely referring to Europe plus Russia, perhaps America. We believe also that the holy alliance of the world counter-revolution and the conspiracy of kings, clergy, nobility, and bourgeoisie based on enormous budgets, on permanent armies, on formidable bureaucracies, and equipped with all the monstrous apparatus of modern centralized states constitutes an overwhelming force. Indeed, that this formidable reactionary coalition can be destroyed only by the greater power of the simultaneous revolutionary alliance and action of all people of the civilized world against this reaction, the isolated revolution of a single people will never succeed. So he's saying, look, if you have a revolution in one country, the state with a standing army and a powerful and organized bureaucracy will crush it every time, right? So for one nation to revolt on its own is silly. It must be simultaneous among all nations. Such a revolution would be folly. A catastrophe for the isolated country and would, in effect, constitute a crime against all other nations. It follows that the uprising of a single people must have in view not only itself, but the whole world. This demands a worldwide program as large, as profound, as true, as human, in short, as all-embracing as the interest of the whole world. 
and in order to energize the passions of all the popular masses of Europe, regardless of nationality, this program can only be the program of the social and democratic revolution. So, revolutions have to be simultaneous around the world or they're going to be crushed. And all one nation does by revolting on its own is make it that much more difficult for the other nations to revolt afterwards because they can all be crushed one by one by one. Briefly stated, the objectives of the social and democratic revolution are politically the, aboli the abolition of the historic rights of states, the rights of conquests, and the diplomatic rights and, and diplomatic rights. It aims at the full emancipation of individuals and associations from divine and human bondage, that's the church, right, and the state, it says. It seeks the absolute destruction of all compulsory unions and all agglomerations of communes into provinces and conquered countries into the state. So all the previous organization of states, of provinces, of nations must be destroyed. Finally, it requires the radical dissolution of the centralized, aggressive, authoritarian state, including its military, bureaucratic, governmental, administrative, judicial, and legislative institutions. Now, revolution, in short, has this aim. Freedom for all, for individuals, as well as collective bodies, associations, communes, provinces, regions, and nations, and the mutual guarantee of this freedom by federation. So you destroy all of the organizational structure of the existing state, and you rebuild it, and each town and commune needs to form federations to support this democratic rebuilding based on universal suffrage at the local level. Socially, it seeks the confirmation of political equality by economic equality. This is not the removal of natural individual differences, but the equality in the social rights of every individual from birth. In particular, equal means of subsistence, support, education, and opportunity for every child, boy or girl, until maturity, and equal resources and facilities in adulthood to create his own well-being by his own labor. So, if you don't have inheritance and you give everybody an equal and free education, free access to health care, then, Bakunin's arguing, you can say you can make whichever money you can based on your own work and talent. Then the individual differences can truly allow one person to work harder and get more than another. But equality must be the start in order for this to happen. So, revolutions must be worldwide, and they must destroy everything as far as organization, apparatus of state and national governments, and then everything, excuse me, must be rebuilt from the ground up on the local level based on universal suffrage of men and women. Education must be free and equal. Inheritance must go so wealth can be redistributed, but this doesn't have to be done in a tyrannical form with the stealing of property. It can simply be stated or made into law that only those who work property can profit from it. So, thanks for listening. Friends for a while with Karl Marx and actually participates with Marx in the uh, International Working Men's Association. And it's actually, uh, that association is split because of the dispute between Marx and Bakunin. And Marx believes that a communist utopia can be achieved by using the power of the state to create a socialist, uh, a socialist state or socialist utopia. Um, and Bakunin believes that the state in all its bureaucracies must be destroyed and then an anarchic government can be built um, starting with, with small, small communities, towns, cities, and built up. Like essentially Bakunin believes that if you try to use the state to create equality among the people, that whoever is in charge will eventually just dominate all the people. Like uh, one of Bakunin's quotes is something like, you know, the most horrific possible combination is socialism and totalitarianism. Which, you know, in a way, Bakunin predicts, you know, um, 75 years early what will happen 
in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. You know, these Bolsheviks consolidate the power of the state, try to use it to create a socialist utopia, and end up just creating a totalitarian nightmare for, for much of the Russian people. So, in this section, um, the Revolutionary Catechism, Bakunin lays out step by step exactly the process he believes to create an anarchist worldwide federation built by new governments starting at the local level, towns and cities, um, created by universal suffrage after the destruction of all existing states. And then these local communities will join, again, based on, based on freedom, universal suffrage, um, as they please, they'll join to form bigger and bigger federations, which Bakunin believes eventually will encompass the world. So in this revolutionary catechism, um, Bakunin lays out this plane in great detail, which is what I'm going to read you now. The first element of the new anarchist government, and now Bakunin starts. He says, replacing the cult of God by respect and love of humanity, we proclaim human reason as the only criterion of truth, human conscious as conscience as the basis of justice, individual and collective freedom as the only source of order in society. And so right off the bat here, you see Bakunin's atheism. And atheism, as we've talked about before, is something many of these anarchists share. And the last selection I read you from Bakunin, God of the State, um, spells out exactly why he's an anarchist and in quite blunt terms um, attacks uh, the institution of particularly the Christian church. So first thing you got to do is get rid of of the belief in God and replace the belief in God with a respect for fellow members of humanity to the top, from the circumference to the center. And so most governments today and most governments at this time, you have a, a federal or central government in the middle that makes laws that everybody else must follow. And Bakunin's idea is that you destroy all that and then you're going to reorganize society starting with the most localized form of government. And the local governments will pass the laws that the people in the localities will need to follow. And the only laws that everybody needs to follow, with a couple exceptions that we'll get to, are ones that all of the localities can agree to. And if one locality doesn't want to follow the laws anymore of their agreement with the other localities, then they are free to leave. Okay. Political organization. It is impossible to determine a concrete, universal, and obligatory norm for the internal development and political organization of every nation. The life of each nation is subordinated to a plethora of different historical, geographical, and economic conditions, making it impossible to establish a model of organization equally valid for all. Any such attempt would be absolutely impractical. It would smother the richness and spontaneity of life which flourishes only in infinite diversity and, what is more, contradict the most fundamental principles of freedom. However, without certain absolutely essential conditions, the practical realization of freedom will be forever impossible. And so what he's saying right there is, on the one hand, you cannot specify one way to organize every society in the world. That's totally against all these principles of anarchy. But he says there are a couple of things that all of these organizations, all of these localities must do if the ultimate goal is truly the freedom for all. So you can't make everybody do everything except, you know, a couple of things if you want people to be free. And so the conditions are that all these localities need to follow to be part of the new anarchist organization of the world. Are the abolition of all state religions in all privileged churches, including those partially maintained or supported by state subsidies, absolute liberty of every religion to build temples to their gods and to pay and support their priests. And so and this is important, right? Bakunin is not saying that you can't have religion. He's saying everybody's free to build a temple or a church and practice whatever religion they want. What he's saying is state money, tax money, citizens' money cannot go to support a church that they don't want to be part of. So no state-supported churches. No tax breaks for the churches, okay? 
So, get rid of state-sponsored and state-subsidized churches. And then he goes on. The church is considered as religious and justice that is based on freedom for everybody. And ultimate freedom. That's the number one prerequisite for the anarchist society is the most amount of freedom that anybody can enjoy and still have some sense of social organization. Okay, he goes on. Freedom is the absolute right of every adult man and woman to seek no other sanction for their acts than their own conscience and their own reason, being responsible first to themselves and then to the society which they have voluntarily accepted. Okay, so one, it's not just men that have freedom, it's women too. And the anarchists are, as far as I can tell, the first people who actually specifically promote the democratic participation of women. They truly believe that everybody's free, not just 49%. And so he says that people, the only consequences um, for their actions should come from their own conscience and their own sense of reason, and that people are responsible to themselves first, right? Taking responsibility for their own actions. And you can see some existentialism here, um, or the beginnings of existentialist thought. And then he says the society that they voluntarily accepted. So one of the major prerequisites of the anarchist society is that individuals can voluntarily join a commune and they can voluntarily leave a commune. And they can never be forced to join any social organization. So that's much different from now, whereas essentially you're a citizen of the country as soon as you're born there. You don't really have a, have a choice. I mean, you can choose to leave and go somewhere else, but you have to choose to leave um, it's assumed that you've chosen to be a citizen if you're born there, and they're expected to follow those laws. He goes on. It is not true that freedom of one man is limited by that of, another, of other men. Man is really free to the extent that his freedom, fully acknowledged and mirrored by the free consent of his fellow men, finds confirmation and expansion in their liberty. Man is truly free only among equally free men, the slavery of even one human being violates humanity and negates the freedom of all. So if one person is a slave, the potential for all people to be slaves exists. And we can only truly understand what it means to be free if we can see that freedom reflected in everybody around us, practice it together, learning from each other. The freedom of each is therefore re realizable only in the equality the realization of freedom through equality in principle and in fact is justice. So justice is the result of individual freedom and the equality of all, right? And if everybody's free, then everybody is equal, and then you can have justice. If there's one fundamental principle, he goes on, of human morality, it is freedom. To respect the freedom of your fellow man is duty. To love, help, and serve them is virtue. And so you start to see right away that Bakunin has a, a nuanced and sophisticated sense of morality. So again, anarchy is not a free-for-all of everybody for themselves. Anarchy requires an education for everyone so that they can understand that they need to respect the freedom of others and to love, help, and serve others. Just Bakunin says this shouldn't be taught by the church out of fear of God, or by the state, out of fear of police action, it should be taught by the fellow people in your town or city for the good of all. Absolute rejection of every authority, including that which sacrifices freedom for the convenience of the state. Primitive society had no conception of freedom, and as society evolved before the full awakening of human rationality and freedom, it passed through a stage controlled by human and divine authority. The political and economic structure of society must now be reorganized on the basis of freedom. Henceforth, order in society must result from the greatest possible realization of individual liberty as well as liberty on all levels of social organization. Okay. So, there can be no authority for the sake of the common good, okay? There's only authority for the sake of individual freedom. So, if your country is passing laws that restrict your freedom for the sake of public safety, 
then according to Bakunin, that is wrong, right? You cannot restrict freedom and still allow people to be free and equal. The political and economic organization of social life must not, as at present, be directed from the summit to the base, the center to the circumference, imposing unity through forced centralization. On the contrary, it must be reorganized to issue from the base to the summit, from the circumference to, or sorry, from the circumference to the center, according to the principles of free association and federation. And then just to back up here for a second, um, he says that primitive society doesn't understand freedom. So the caveman doesn't necessarily understand freedom. And then he says, before, say, the Enlightenment, when people truly understand that people are free and that folks are rational, before that, people were ruled by kings and by churches. And he says that now that people understand that people are born free and born rational so they can accept the consequences of their freedom, society needs to be reorganized in totality. And that's why he's advocating for and fighting for these anarchist revolutions, for the reorganization of global society for the freedom of all. And so he says in this next one that society needs to be reorganized from the bottom Hi, today I'm going to read to you Mikhail Bakunin's Revolutionary Catechism, published in 1866 while he was in a Russian prison. Now, Mikhail, Mikhail Bakunin is probably the most important, in my opinion, father of the anarchist movement, which blossoms in the mid to late 1800s. Um, the anarchists play a, a significant role in the revolutions of 1848, um, Bakunin himself is involved in a revolution in the Czech, in, uh, the Czech Republic in 1848, uh, and he's involved in, well, it wasn't the Czech Republic back then, back then, but in the Czech Revolution. And he's involved in a revolution in France in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. He spends much of his life in and out of Russian prisons. I think he's sentenced to death at least three times. Um, he escapes from Siberia. He eventually settles in Switzerland, um, where he dies peacefully in 1876. He's born in 1814. In his youth, he's kicked out of a Russian military school. He really wants to pursue a career as a uh, professor of philosophy. He goes to Germany to study philosophy. He falls in love with German philosophers, um, Hegel in particular, and moves to Paris after becoming a revolutionary. And once he becomes really interested in revolutionary ideology, and you know, beginning with the Napoleonic era and the French Revolution, you have waves of revolution going through Europe, particularly in 1848. Because of his act revolutionary activity, Bakunin very quickly is, has no chance of becoming a philosopher at any state-sponsored university or philosophy professor, and moves from state to state, fomenting and participating in revolutions. Um, he participates in a Czech Revolution in 1848. He participates in a Polish Revolution around the same time. He participates in a French insurrection in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. He uh, helps, re he helps uh, revolutions in Italy against uh, Giuseppe Manzini, I believe. So Bakunin isn't just a, a philosopher of the word or an anarchist of the word, as these guys are called, who sits and writes philosophy and doesn't take any action. Bakunin is truly a man of action. And because of that, he spends much of his life in and out of prison. He's uh, sentenced to death, I think, three times. Um, loses all of his teeth in a Russian prison to scurvy. Uh, he escapes Siberia and eventually, later in life, settles in Switzerland, um, where he dies in 1876. Uh, he's born in 1814. Um, Bakunin in, when he's in Paris, he meets Pierre Joseph Proudhon, one of the other major founders of, uh, of anarchy or the anarchist movement, along with Kropotkin in Russia and perhaps Nietzsche in Russia. And he also uh, meets and, and becomes fr 